Alrighty, here we go. My name is Travis Neville. This is the Travis Neville Podcast, uh, where we are helping men build their kingdoms, prove themselves, improve their world. Uh, and by their world, I mean their world, not the world. Keep your keep your sights uh, down to your local level. Keep your circle small, and make it as strong as you can possibly make it. Um, as far as the state of the situation here, I just ordered 50 copies of my book from my publisher because I can get them from like I can get them there for a lot cheaper than you can get them on Amazon. Still only 15 bucks on Amazon to get a copy of the new book, Reviving Masculinity. Uh, I recommend you check it out. I ask that you buy it. Uh, it's only 15 bucks, small price to pay, helps me out, helps uh, keep the money coming in here. It makes me feel like what I'm doing is working. I love putting this time in to put together ideas and thoughts to help you guys as much as I can. And uh, that's the only way I can make some money on this. Oh, actually, there is another way. TravisNeville.com. You can get autographed copies of the book. You can get uh, T-shirts. The new T-shirts are in. I just uh, I got one here. I'm still working with Blue Collar Clothing in Mayo, Michigan. They've been awesome. Still got the uh, podcast on the back, Travis Neville podcast on the back on the sleeve. You got the, the blue collar clothing logo, and and then on the other sleeve another blue collar logo, but it's that backwards uh, American flag to give you the you know a little bit of America in there. They're pretty cool. They've got the their little embellishments here, a little more red, white, and blue, and then on the front the new ones say ideal man right across the chest so if that's uh, something you're interested in if you're trying to become the best man you can be we should be rocking this t-shirt i just got a bunch more of them there on the website or if you know me just hit me up shoot me a text i'll send you one for free i'm happy to do that to help out uh, make a few bucks etc uh yeah 50 more copies of the book to send out i realized i so I, I took an order the other day i mean most people just order them on amazon and I don't get to track that, but um, I got an order through my website for a gentleman in the Yukon Territory, Dawson City, uh, Yukon Territory, Canada. And I looked up where that is. It's like right on the border with Alaska. It is way the hell up there. And I was happy to send this guy um, a copy of each of my books. He wanted an autographed copy of each. So I sent them to him, and uh, that made me feel good, but it was my last copy. Like, I gave him my personal copy. <laughs> That's what I sent to him for the Reviving Masculinity. I had a few more Jocelyn Methods hanging around, but, um, yeah, that was cool. So it's all over the place, man. It's in India. I've, I've shipped to United Kingdom. I've shipped to Australia. I've shipped to Germany. Um, yeah, lots and lots of places. I'm excited about that, and I had to order some new books. So that's where we are with the state of the situation. Um yeah, we're moving along. I got the the house is 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 coming, um, sorta. Like uh, I think it was Monday of last week. My concrete guy was there working on um, building block. You know, doing still working on my foundation, and nothing has happened since then. And uh, granted, yeah, it's been raining, but um, you know, it's not raining that much. It's not like he's painting. Anyway, I have to have confidence in the thought that in the idea that this guy's a pro and knows what he's doing so i got to keep reminding myself of that i gotta be like you know what he's he knows what he's doing and and on some level i gotta have you know i feel pretty cool that there's this one step that i don't have to be there on. like i don't have to help so <laughs> that's kind of nice um yeah, i can just watch it happen know that it's getting done by pros and i'm just hoping that's going to happen soon here we get that foundation in before this before it freezes because you know it's middle of October. We're in northern Michigan. I mean, we're probably got another month, but uh, you know, sooner we can get a shell, you know, a building up, then I can start working on it. And anyway, that's how that's going. And I was thinking about that. I was thinking about how I have to leave things in the hands of other people, which is a thing I don't like doing. And I'll be the first one to tell you that. Yeah, that's uh, not awesome. But I have to have confidence in these people. I've got to believe that they're going to get shit done for me. And so I started thinking, you know. What is confidence? What is it? You hear it all the time. You see it. It's for a lot of people. It's this fleeting, elusive concept. Um, you know, maybe you are confident in some things and not confident in others. And I just kind of started digging in. Is it just an appearance? Do people just get good at looking confident? Is there any value in that? It, or is it a deep, meaningful feeling? You know what I mean? Like, 
are you ever really truly confident in anything? You know, I did a lot of uh, research when I was in college on uh, sports psychology, and one of the it's it's almost universal that people who get to an elite level in athletics, and I've found since then that people who get to an elite level in anything uh, often have imposter syndrome. What's imposter syndrome? Well, it's uh, believing that you got to where you are by some kind of fluke, that uh, the next step that you take is where you're going to get exposed and people are going to realize you don't know what the fuck you're doing. And it's all, you faked it up till here and you've just been good at faking it. Or you just got lucky up till here and it's all going to fall apart. And uh, that's, that's super common. And I think what it is, I mean, I remember reading about it again, this was about 20 years ago when I was in college, but um, you know, that imposter syndrome, what's behind that is just fear. Really? I mean, fear is behind everything that's bad as far as I'm concerned. That's why chapter one of the first book is called Beat Fear. But, um, you know, I, th I think, you know, I think this, uh, the research that I do, the research that I've done on, on confidence points me to this. Um, and we talked about this before. If you're going to be a leader and, and leadership and manhood are exactly the same thing. I mean, there are just only tiny little differences. Basically, if you're a man, you are always leading, right? So if you're going to be a leader at all, sometimes you're going to have to make it look like you're confident when you're not. You know what I mean? Like that phrase, fake it till you make it. Um, you know, there's some there's some truth to that. If you can, uh, you know, and it isn't just like a sales thing. It's not a like a, like I'm fake, you know, I'm, I'm trying to con people. That's not what it is. Uh, if you're in a leadership position, that means that you're leading people. And those people are going to be more successful if they sense confidence on your part if you're the one who's making the decisions and moving them in the direction that you're moving if you're confident in that they'll feel better they just will i mean i i can't tell you how many times as a football coach i've been on a sideline and 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 was thinking all right i'm not really sure about what we're doing here but i can't let those kids see that because now they're gonna not believe it you know if, if you're all together and and you're 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 believing in a thing well you're gonna be you're just way more likely to be successful. So in that case, yeah, a lot of times confidence is just a, it can just be an act. Now, I'd say a lot of times, it's certainly not the majority. Real, true, rooted confidence is a result very simply of experience, right? And it's, it's, it's a combination, and we'll talk about both. It's successful experience that gives you confidence, and it's failure. That'll also give you confidence. Uh, how does that work? Well, just very briefly, failure can give you confidence because you're like, okay, I tried this one thing and it didn't work and I'm not doing that thing. So yeah, I'm probably not going to fail again because I, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I know what doesn't work and I'm not doing that. That's how failure can give you confidence. And of course, winning, succeeding, you know, well, what did you do? What worked? Do that again. You know, so that's what real confidence is. It's experience. It's time on task. It's having done a thing lots of times. Now, um, it's not, uh, but it doesn't start that way. You know what I mean? The first time I picked up a basketball, I wasn't confident at all. I had to dribble a lot and shoot a lot and, and take that first step a lot, shoot a lot of free throws. And I had to do all those things to get to where I was reasonably competent as a basketball player, you know, and it took years and years and I still wasn't that great, but boy, I tried like hell. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, that's what it takes. It takes it takes time on task. So th this is us kind of right now just sort of defining what is confidence. So you start there, right? What is it? What is it? How does it work? Uh, so there's a little discussion on that. And I want to I want to now give some examples or some some stories, a little bit an anecdotal evidence about uh, when it works, how it works. Um, you know, confidence. Here we are. <laughs> so. <laughs> So we'll go back to the imposter syndrome. I want to talk about football coaching a little bit more. I was in a in an all coaches meeting uh, a few years ago, and it had our the entire football staff was in there, and there were twenty five guys or something, and um, and it, I had a uh, one of the assist, one of my assistants came up. I think he was my assistant at the time. It might not not have been, but came up and he he was talking about how um, he just didn't know he knew that he didn't know as much as the coaches around him. He knew that he wasn't experienced enough. So he just was trying to learn and learn and learn. That's why he didn't say anything. He never said anything in practice. He never said anything in meetings because he was just trying to learn. Well, I like that idea. I like that idea of, Hey, when you're first starting, which this guy, 
you know, I think he was only a year in with us, um, but he had football knowledge prior. Anyway, um, I, I like that concept of, hey, you know, learn before you teach. But unfortunately, coaching football, coaching at a high school level like we were doing, you don't have that luxury of sitting back like Aaron Rodgers and just getting good at being a quarterback for four years under one of the best or five years or however long Brett Favre was starting in front of him. Um, you got to start, you know, you got to play right away. You know what I mean? You have to be getting that, making a contribution, right? So what I told him was this, and I had a long conversation with him on the side, but I also sort of called him out in front of the whole staff. What I said was, it wasn't really to him, actually, it was to everybody. I said that, uh, you know, when you, in front of a group, when you share a thing, say you're at work and you're in a meeting and you have an idea, um, when you share that idea, there's 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 only three things that'll happen. The first thing is that people are going to uh, ostracize you, fuck with you, call you names, be a total asshole, call you stupid, roll their eyes, all of that shit. That's the first thing that I, I suppose potentially could happen. Um, and here's the thing. If you work at a place where that could happen, you need to get a new fucking job. Because you're working around the wrong types of people where there is no leadership there is no organization there is no unified uh solidarity that hey we're all on the same team trying to accomplish the same goal here and we are only interested in things that will help us and ridiculing people helps no one so if you are at a place where that's going to happen go somewhere else and go somewhere else immediately okay because you're in a toxic poisonous environment so let's take that off the table. Let's assume that you're someplace reasonably productive, right? Someplace that's efficient and interested in getting better. So the only other two things that could happen are number one, um, you could be wrong. Okay, and by wrong, most of the time, that usually just means that you're the minority. Your, your, your idea is one that lots of other people like a different idea more. Okay, so but we'll just call it wrong for the sake of sake of this conversation. So that's item one. You could be wrong. And what is the outcome there? Okay. Uh, number one, you have maybe exposed some minds in that room who hadn't thought of it before about a, a minority idea that hadn't been brought up yet, about a thing that no one else had thought about yet. And maybe it can be some sort of contribution. So you know what I mean? So that's a positive. The other thing is, well, you know, let's just say you're wrong. Okay. Now you learned. Okay. You came up with this idea. It didn't work. Or maybe it does work, but they don't like it. Um, so you're going to learn. You're going to learn from these all these other people who you would imagine are more uh, seasoned. They know what they're doing. They've been there longer, whatever it is. And you're going to get better. So that's option two. You're wrong and you get better. Okay. The third thing that can happen when you bring up an idea is that you're right, okay? And, and this idea that you just shared um, makes everyone better, right? And, you know, you risk the, 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 the you know, like the, the whiny bitch idea that the rest of the people, the majority, aren't going to like the idea just because it wasn't theirs. And again, I think you're in the wrong environment if that's the case. Um, or it's, you're going to hurt their feelings because they, they didn't come up with it. Uh, you know, I suppose that's a possibility. But again, I think you're working with the wrong people if that's a possibility. If you're in a good organization uh, moving forward and you come up with an idea that's better than everybody else's, whoever the leader in that room is should will recognize that and say, holy fuck, that's awesome. Why didn't, why didn't anybody else think of that? That's brilliant. So that's the, that's the third outcome. You are right, okay, when you share a thing. And the only thing, you know, and you can, this is just so common in coaching, right? Every coaching staff I've been on, shit, I've felt it myself a hundred times, probably more than that. I'm like, man, I just don't want to look stupid. I don't want to look like I don't know what I'm doing with all these other alpha males, right? Like that's a dangerous environment. Shit, it's a dangerous environment when you're with a bunch of women in an English department. They're not alpha males, but man, they're going to talk shit about you if you do something they don't like. I learned that the hard way about a hundred times. Um, yeah, that, it's just not going to happen. Nobody's going to light you up and blow you up over it. That's what you're afraid of, but it's not going to happen. So the only other two outcomes are both good. Either you're wrong and you get better, or you're right and everyone gets better. And that's why they fucking pay you. 
that's why you're there is to make this thing move forward, whatever it is, be it your business, your team, um, your, your relationship, your marriage, your children, um, your neighborhood, whatever it is. Um, those are the three outcomes and get rid of the first one. It's only the last two that really are of any kind of consequence or of any kind of likelihood, I should say. Either you're wrong and you get better or you're right and everyone gets better. Both of those are good, right? So that's the, the imposter syndrome thing. Hey, I don't want to share this because I don't want everybody to think that I got here because I'm an idiot. I'm fake. I'm stupid. I don't know what I'm doing. And it's just, it's a, it's a ridiculous thing to be afraid of. It's not a ridiculous thing to be afraid of, but to have that fear stop you from improving the company and improving yourself, improving the organization, whatever it is that you're part of, it's outrageous. You just can't do it. You know what I mean? It is your responsibility to share your ideas. You have to. Okay. Then that's part of confidence. All right. Confidence is I might not be right here, but I'm going to act as if, right. I'm going to confidently share, Hey, this is what I've come up with. This is what I think is the best option here. And someone might enlighten you and you'll be smarter or you are enlightening them and they'll be smarter, but you, you gain nothing by presenting that information. Well, well, maybe if we, I, I don't know, have you guys ever thought of, I just I was looking around and right. How you present it goes a long way. So this is what it has to do. This is what imposter syndrome has to do with confidence. All right. Sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. Sometimes you got to look like you know what you're talking about, even if you're not 100% sure yourself. All right. And there's lots of times in, in life when you're, well, shit, that's our best idea. Maybe it's not that good, but we got to do something. Right. Teddy Roosevelt said that, um, the worst thing that you can do in any situation is nothing. The best thing, he said, is, is the right thing. The second best thing is the wrong thing. And the, the worst thing you can do is absolutely nothing at all. So even making a going out there and doing the wrong thing, making a mistake, you know, that leads you to success in the end because you now you know a thing not to do, right? Yeah, so that's um, that's the coaching story. Only two outcomes, right? Another thing... Um, you know, that, that builds confidence. Really. We talked about this already was, uh, is, uh, is that experience. So like, let's get a, for an example here in your relationship, you have two different ways. Let's start, actually, let's start with your job. Let's start there. Uh, there's two different ways that you can go to work. And if you guys remember the office space, remember the movie office space, great shit, super funny. Uh, a lot of truths in there. Uh, good stuff. Um, I remember him, the main character, saying, you know, I've got four bosses, which means that every time I make a mistake, i got to hear about it four times. So really, my motivation isn't to do a good job every day. It's to avoid getting yelled at. And that's only going to make you work hard enough to not get fired, which I would call that absolutely bare minimum, right? And again, that's not what they're paying you for. Uh, so yeah, that again, from office space, that's the idea. Work only hard enough to not get fired. That's one way to operate. The other way is to pull out the stops and do your job the best way you possibly can and just let getting fired just fall out of your head. Now, I think that's the only way to live, really. That's the only way to do anything, whether it's your job or raising your kids or, you know, how you work out or your relationship for sure. You know, because there's acting in a manner that'll keep you from losing her. And then there's an, there's the acting in a manner that's going to make this the best relationship you've ever had. You know, I've talked about this before. So many things go back to football because, you know, the reason I like football so much is because every lesson that I ever taught as a football coach is immediately transferable, translatable and transferable to life. You know, the dedication, the teamwork, the, the risk taking, all that shit. And I say this all the time, there's playing to win and there's playing to not lose. You've heard the, the idea that uh, at the defense, the prevent defense, which is common in basketball, uh, it's also common in football. When you know your way ahead, you set your safeties way back, you, you, you let them, you give them the short stuff and you just, uh, you know, just don't let them score a touchdown. Uh, the only thing prevent defense prevents, prevents is, uh, is winning. <laughs> <laughs> you're making it easier for them to score. I mean, because really, let's, again, let's translate it to life. 
that uh, those deep safeties mean that you're going to give them all the underneath stuff, which means they're going to chew up yards. They're going to move forward, move forward, move forward, move forward. And now you're fighting the clock. You're hoping that you can, st- you know, the game is over before they get all the way down the field. But that's how life works. You, it's, it's that consistency. It's that moving forward. This is the big bang plays. You know what I mean? That's not really what kills you in life. That's not how you get ahead in life. You get ahead by grinding, right? We've talked about that. So yeah, there's uh, the football thing there of um, you can work hard enough to not lose or you can work to make your shit the best you can possibly be. And I think that translates into, like I said, into so many parts of your life. Um, yeah, think about this, you know, like the, the times that you failed as a as, at work you've got fired before right um you can work hard enough to not get fired or you can work hard enough to be awesome at your job knowing that that's part of the risk you know i think about every football coach i know including me and we've all been fired from football coaching jobs it's just how it goes but if you're willing to keep grinding and get you know you go on move on to the next job you're going to be all right so it's nothing to be afraid of same thing in in your your relationship work hard enough not to lose her or work hard enough, to, or work so hard that you're, you're going to build the best relationship you've ever had, right? I think a lot of it, a lot of confidence is uh, is just being comfortable being uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Like, being uncomfortable is okay with you. Not knowing all the answers, not knowing how it's going to going to happen is, is, is okay to you. Um, you know, and there's a lot of pieces to that, too. I think that, like, let's say, I think about... Um, in my job, if I know I'm taking these risks, uh, I'm being bold and I'm making moves and I'm trying to improve my career, I know sometimes those are going to fail. And I'm completely comfortable with that because lots of other times, most times, that boldness is going to pay off and I'm going to succeed and I'm going to su- succeed pretty big, right? So I like to take those risks. In my mind, that is the difference between playing to not lose and playing to win. It's how much how much risk are you willing to take? And I love it, man. I love to take risks. I talk about that all the time. You know, I'm not a big gambler. Gambling isn't really enjoyable to me. Now, I've got a DraftKings app on my phone, and I like to bet the NFL. I don't bet more than 10 bucks a bet. I bet like two, three bets a week. And uh, this last week, I got beat up. <laughs> like, I lost all my bets. But the week before that, I won every one of them. Because um, you know what? I like to take the long shots. And I know that's how I work. So, um, you know, limit my losses, et cetera, but I still like to, I like to take those risks. And I think that translates really well into life. You know, um, the more risk you can tolerate, probably the more confident you are, right? Because if you can't handle the risk, you're losing your mind. You're like, okay, this is too stressful. Well, well, it's probably because you don't have a lot of confidence in it. You know, and sometimes you can, you can source that like for me with the gambling, um, you know, I start the year with a hundred bucks in my account. Maybe like last year, halfway through, I had to put another hundred bucks in. And by the end of the year, I had, I don't know, 75 bucks left or something like that. And I bet it all in the Super Bowl and I lost it. So I spent $200 for the whole football season. I, I had a lot of fun and I had zero dollars left at the end. <laughs> Thanks Rams for not covering. And, uh, uh, you know, it just, uh, but it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. That risk to me, you've got to decide what your tolerance level is for it. And it's going to be directly directly related to your, your confidence in it. And sometimes confidence is is stepping back and looking at the diversity of your life. The, you know, how diverse are your investments, right? Like I've got a great personal life. I've got really awesome friends, a great family. Um, you know, you guys know I'm working on this house. Um, I've got my business pursuits. I've got two different businesses, two different things that pay me, um, pretty well. And then I have, you know, the book stuff like this that, you know, I'm actually starting to make a little bit of money, which is kind of cool. Um, but so if one of those goes down, I'm, I don't, it's okay. I've got two other things there to hold me up as far as the money. Right. And with my personal relationships, if I lose somebody for whatever reason over a misunderstanding or something, which I think is an unusual circumstance. My, all of my friends have been around since the 80s for the most part. Um, you know, it's not that uh, it's not that big of a deal. I've got lots of other friends. You know, I hate saying it that way. I don't want to cheapen it that way, but it makes it easier to be real honest with somebody, for example. If you've got to tell one of your buddies some shit that they don't want to hear, but they need to hear it, it takes a lot of courage on your part to tell it to them. And I think that's, I think I know that's love. 
to take the, hey man, I'm willing to risk our relationship to do this thing that I think is going to help you. I talk about my buddy uh, Dixon who did that for me right before I got married. He's like, man, you need to get the fuck out of that relationship. It's gonna, she's going to wreck you. you know? And he knew it would risk our relationship and it did for a while. And I should have fucking listened. He was right. You know what I mean? Took a lot of balls to do that. And I really appreciated that from him. I mean, in the end, I did. Looking back on it, I still appreciate it today. Um, yeah, so there's the risk, right? And again, you can tolerate more risk if you're confident in the rest of your life. If you feel like you're strong in other places, well, then you can take a little risk on this, a little risk on that, and you're okay. You know, you are not your career, for example. You know, what you do to make money, that isn't who you are. And this is coming from a person who used to be a teacher. And teaching is one of those things where you don't say, I do teaching. You say, I am a teacher, right? It kind of is a big part of who you are, right? And it was tough for me to lose that. It was tough for me to not be teaching again. But I learned that what I just told you, um, what you do for a living is not who you are. It's just what you do for a living. You don't have to love it. You don't have to be amazing at it. You just have to make money during the day. Who you are is who you are with your friends and your family and even by yourself. That's who you are. Your job is, again, it's just it's a trade-off. You're giving them eight hours a day uh, to make enough money so that you can live the rest of your life. The other parts of your life, the other 16 hours a day, and then, you know, your, your full weekends, right? So having that confidence going in makes a big difference, you know, when you're not afraid to lose your job because you're confident in the rest of the parts of your life, it'll go a long way. And your relationship likewise. I mean, it's not uh, losing it. You won't die. I can guarantee you that. Like, I mean, unless you're 86, you know, and you they say you die of a broken heart, but I think it's more you just give up. You don't want to be around anymore after your partner's gone. And that's a sad situation, but it's also beautiful. It really is. I was talking to a girl about that just the other day, how that uh, how that can go. Um, yeah, so so here's the thing, you know, kind of summing it up with confidence. Um, you know, Jordan Peterson says, and this is chapter one of his 12 Rules for Life, stand up straight with your shoulders back. You know, and he, he means that, like, show your confidence, even if you're not 100% confident, okay? Because you got nothing to lose by doing that. You're going to lead the people around you, okay? You're going to be more affable, more approachable. People are going to trust you, respect you more. Uh, and believe it or not, just your physical posture and just acting as if, faking it till you make it just a little bit, that's going to make you more confident. It's going to give you more of that deep, meaningful feeling of confidence, of knowing that you've got this. Because things are going to happen. You're going to stand up straight with your shoulders back, and people are going to treat you differently. They are. It's going to happen. You know what I mean? They might, you know, like the jam I'd get in is, you know, when I was teaching, it'd be, oh, he's an asshole. Nobody ever said I didn't know what I was talking about. Nobody ever said that. And no one ever called me a bad teacher. Not one fucking time. I was good at my job. There's there's no doubt about that. So that might come your way, but, you know, do it. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. He talks about that, you know, that um, what you're doing is actually physically showing your your weaknesses. Like, where are you physically weak? Where are you physically uh, prone to, to damage and injury? It's at your, your lower torso, your stomach, right? That's where in your heart and your lungs and your, 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 your uh, vitals. Um, and if you're hunched over and protecting them, that means that shows defensiveness. It shows that you are a victim. It doesn't show that you are confident and strong and uh, able to handle the world, able to handle the waves as they're coming in with your strong boat, right? Another Peterson theme. So that's what it is, confidence. Um, yeah, all that came from thinking about the fact that my concrete guy hasn't done shit on my house for like a week. And that, is, you know, got me a little bit worried, but, you know, Act, act as if, act confidently. And, uh, you know, here's the thing. I wrote a book called Reviving Masculinity. My first book's called The Jossman Method. You can get them both on Amazon. You can get them on travisneville.com. I'll send you an autographed copy. What I like to do is if you have a social media presence and you ask for an autographed copy, I'll go in and look at your social media and find some personal shit about you, and I'll include that in my autograph. This one dude ordered one. He's big into cigars and bourbon. So I was like, hey, man, good cigars, good bourbon, great rewards for an ideal man. And I signed it, you know what I mean? Uh, good shit like that. Uh, yeah, check that stuff out if you can. 
again, my name is Travis Neville. This is the Travis Neville Podcast. I hope that in some way today's discussion of confidence has helped you to get your shit together. Have a great week.